Hello, and welcome to the second in our series of webinars on sexual violence prevention in Ontario. This webinar series is a part of OPS Campaign Messengers Taking a Stand initiative, a school-based approach whose goal is to build the capacity of students and educators in Ontario to be leaders in their schools in addressing the root causes of sexual violence and harassment through the promotion of healthy relationships, consent, and equality. If you want to learn more about the Campaign Messengers initiative and how you and your school can get involved, because we're still accepting registrations, of course, we've provided the link to our webpage on the screen under the Register Now one. This is the second in a series of three webinars. The last webinar was presented by Alex Duffy from AGAL Canada Human Rights Trust, and the final webinar will be presented by Julie Lalonde from Draw the Line next week. If you're interested in that, just head to our um, Campaign Messengers page and you can see the details for registration and all of that good stuff. So, today we're very excited to have Véronique Church Duplessis, Program Manager with White Ribbon Canada, with us to talk about how our future has no place for violence against women. Welcome, Véronique. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thanks to you and Sarah for inviting me to speak uh, again, and thanks for everyone who's attending. Uh, it's very exciting for me uh, to be here today, and I look forward to talking about our work and how we can support each other uh, in some more details as we uh, move along uh, with this webinar. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that this uh, talk can be sensitive. A lot of the topics we talk about can be difficult. So uh, I invite you to get help if uh, that uh, appeals to you, if that feels necessary. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a get help link that will take you to some of the numerous resources that are available uh, for you uh, to support you. Um, when working on this webinar, I decided to take a bit more of a professional development approach. So we're going to look a bit more today at how we can use the white ribbon draw the line resources uh, to get involved and engage in sexual violence uh, prevention. So we're going to jump right in with one of the resources that we have developed specifically for high school students. This is one of the new draw the line uh, scenarios uh, that was created to raise, raise awareness about sexual violence uh, and to educate youth about possible responses to uh, in incidents of uh, sexual violence. So here we have a scenario where um, your teammate tells you that the coach is always touching them to correct their stance and it feels weird. So as a bystander in this situation, would you tell them that they're worrying about uh, nothing? Um, I have the first poll question uh, for you. So in your opinion, what is the issue with this scenario? Jen, if you can pull up the poll. Uh, a, it's probably nothing. B, it's sexual assault. Uh, it's sexual harassment. If you can take a second to click on the one that you feel is uh, the most accurate, uh, that would be uh, appreciated. All right. So the goal of the campaign is really to teach bystanders to not ignore signs uh, of sexual violence and to not ignore calls for help. Uh, this means that everybody has a duty uh, and uh, everybody needs to stand up when we see those uh, situations occurring. We will return to uh, this scenario a little bit later uh, in the presentation, and uh, the correct answer would be um, a sexual assault, and we'll explain what, why that is uh, later during the presentation. But uh, what I want to know, so I have a second poll already. <laughs> there are only four, so we won't spend all of our time doing that. But as educators and as people working with youth, what are some of the challenges you would anticipate if you were to discuss a, a scenario like that in your classroom or in your school or in your community? So um, if you were to uh, do talk about this in your community. Jen, can you pull up the second poll? Would you, A, feel that you're not knowledgeable enough to talk about consent and sexual violence? Would you be afraid of triggering your students or the staff? Uh, do you think that your professional relationship with the students make it difficult to di discuss sensitive topics like these? Or do you, do you not anticipate any significant challenges?
All right, I think everyone participated. This is great. Um, so, Jen, can you show the results? So we have a few people who feel that they're not knowledgeable enough, uh, some people who are afraid of triggering the students and staff, and a few, a few of you who feel uh, equipped to have those discussions uh, in the classroom. For those of you who have concerns, uh, I hope that uh, this webinar today will help you build your capacity to have those discussions uh, in your classroom. So we're, uh, our goal is to aim um, to help you face some of these challenges. So we'll be looking at two main things. Uh, today, first we'll look at um, developing our ability to be good allies and active bystanders. Uh, and how we can teach that to youth in our classrooms. And uh, second, we'll focus on how um, rigid gender norms lead to violence. So look a bit at the root causes of violence and violence against women. And actually, we'll, we're going to start with a second point uh, and an examination of how rigid gender norms lead to violence. So uh, this is a plaque in the park in Montreal to the memory of the 14 victims of the Montreal Massacre uh, on December 6th, 1989. Um, I used to go by that park every day on my uh, way to university, and it's a powerful reminder that violence against women can take extreme forms, that misogyny uh, can be deadly. And White Ribbon, the organization I work for, was founded by uh, a group of men following uh, that, uh, that the Montreal Massacre, uh, men who felt that they had a role to play to end violence against women. Uh, so our, at White Ribbon, we uh, are working to end violence against women, but also uh, promote gender equity and equality, healthy relationships, and a new healthy vision of masculinity. And we believe that this is very much everyone's issue and that uh, men need to be part of the solution. So we've conducted a survey, I think it was in 2012, that showed that the overwhelming majority of men uh, themselves are not violent and they certainly do not condone violence against women. And what we want to do now is go a step further uh, and equip these men who feel very concerned uh, with regards to the issue of violence against women, equip them with tools so that it can be part of our efforts to end uh, violence against women. So we want to help them embrace their potential to be part of positive change and to encourage them to become allies and active bystanders. Uh, we do that in four different interrelated ways. First, we do that through a critical discussion of uh, rigid gender norms. So we try to deconstruct gender stereotypes and see how these stereotypes are harmful. Uh, we talk about uh, toxic masculinity or hypermasculinity, and then we emphasize instead and promote instead healthy masculinities. Second, we help male-identified people and, in fact, everyone develop uh, their emotional intelligence and their ability uh, to use nonviolent communication. So we focus on uh, our ability to recognize emotions, articulate those feelings, and express those feelings in nonviolent ways. Uh, and this is crucial to ending violence against women. Then we promote what we call consent culture as opposed uh, to rape culture. Uh, rape culture normalizes the objectification of women and it trivializes violence against women. So instead, we want to promote a consent culture where everybody's uh, boundaries are uh, respected. And finally, we promote bystander uh, interventions. We want to get bystanders to become active. We want to get everyone involved in the prevention of violence against women. So one activity we often do with adults and youth when we talk about rigid gender norms is this man box uh, activity. And um, if you've attended the training uh, that Ophia organized uh, in um, November, you are no doubt familiar with the activity. My colleague Kevin presented it. Um, if we have more time, 
we could spend, uh, we could do this all together. But if you want to use a chat function, maybe you can put in a couple of words. Uh, so when we think about the stereotypes that are associated with being the man or a man, uh, the alpha male, um, what would those stereotypes be? And uh, then once we analyze those, we can see how they can potentially lead to violence against women and girls. So if you can think and take a second or two to write down a few words that come to mind in terms of uh, stereotypical gender norms uh, associated with being uh, an alpha male, that might be interesting. I can read uh, your results as you post them. Tough, strong, no crying, athletic, non-emotional, yes, all of that. Brave, yes. Rugged, strong, physically intimidating, yes. Right, so I think that pretty much everyone has a, a picture in their head of what this uh, stereotypical man could look like. Um, and usually there's a second step to this activity where we would list on the outside of the box the insults and slurs that are used to police uh, the gender and the masculinity of individuals who do not conform to these norms. Um, just for the sake of time here, I have a, a typical man box that illustrates uh, those stereotypes and then the insults that are used commonly to police the masculinity of the men uh, and the male-identified folks who do not conform. And as you will see, most of these insults are either homophobic or sexist. So this shows a devaluation of anything considered feminine or not masculine enough. Um, if you want to do this in, the, in your classroom, uh, we also provide a bunch of questions that can help our critical reflection upon these uh, rigid gender norms. Um, you can ask your students or your colleagues if they feel any pressures to conform to those gender norms and how that makes them feel. You can take some time to think and reflect upon where these gender norms come from. Uh, why we often use the concept of hypermasculinity or toxic masculinity to refer to this stereotypical alpha male that we've just discussed. And then we can uh, move a step further and talk about how toxic masculinity can lead to violence against women and gender inequality. And finally, what we can do differently to move outside of the men box and promote healthier masculinities. Um, I have a quote here. So there's uh, an article in Muscle Fitness that was uh, saying that Dwayne Johnson is the man. And you can see that this pretty much embodies the alpha male that we've just described in the man box activity. But I'd like to draw your attention more to the quote on the left hand side of the screen here. That's a quote from a 14 year old boy in Alberta who understands how rigid gender norms do uh, lead to violence. Um, there's so much stuff like guys shouldn't cry, guys need to have big muscles, guys can't show feelings, they can't show pain, you know. So if you can't do all that, it's just going to build up inside of you got, and you've got to let it out somehow. Either you can be a good, it, either that can be a good conversation or it can be a good release where you start a fight with uh, somebody. Um, so this young man who's 14 already understands that the repression of feelings, the fact that uh, men are supposed to be emotionless and that the only acceptable emotion uh, is anger, can and does lead uh, to violence. And this young boy also understands that one way that we can move away from that is to have good conversations and um, healthier masculine norms. So. This is one thing that we emphasize in our work. Uh, we can move uh, beyond those unhealthy gender norms. Uh, we are all able to promote healthier masculinities, healthy relationships uh, in our work and um, in our daily lives. So what we emphasize in our work is that manhood is not defined by using violence against women or against men. It is not defined by how much pain you can endure. 
It is not defined by the power you exert over others, and it is not defined by your sexual orientation. So healthy masculinities are much more flexible and uh, do not rely on rigid uh, gender norms. And part of healthy masculinities is this ability to develop our emotional intelligence and use uh, nonviolent communication skills. So on the left here, you have a, a little picture of the various expressions of Vader. Uh, and you see that despite the fact that Vader maybe has all of these emotions, he's not able to express them, um, to articulate them uh, to the world around them. So um, what we try to emphasize is that there's a whole variety um, of emotions and that being aware of our emotions is essential to um, healthy masculinity and healthy relationships. And we need to practice um, the skills that are connected to emotional intelligence on a, a regular basis. Uh, there are three parts to our emotional intelligence. The first is uh, our experiences. The second is experiencing the feelings and the emotions. And uh, the last part is expressing our needs and recognizing our needs. So, for example, if you got called a name, this is the experience, uh, you might feel hurt, confused, you might feel betrayed, you might feel sad. And all of these emotions stem from the, this very basic need, uh, and the, that is the need to feel safe um, and loved. So if we are able to recognize where our emotions come from, where our needs come from, and if we are able to articulate that, we can move um, away from uh, anger and from violence. Um, emotional intelligence and nonviolent communication skills are also essential to being uh, good bystanders. Um, they can help you recognize why you would want to intervene when you witness uh, an incident of sexual violence. So you might be able to identify what's holding, your, holding you back. For example, are you afraid of being rejected if the incident involves one of your peers? Um, rejection is uh, especially problematic when the person who exhibits the problematic behavior is uh, a friend or perhaps someone with authority. Emotional intelligence also can help you identify why you would want to intervene. Uh, you might be able to recognize that empathy motivates you uh, to support uh, survivors. And nonviolent communication is essential to being a good bystander. Uh, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with the five different steps of nonviolent communication. The, these build upon uh, emotional intelligence, intelligence and consent. So first, um, you would get permission to engage. Uh, then you would offer your observations or formulate your questions. Then you would articulate your feelings, your needs, and uh, your requests. So when you witness uh, an, a situation, an incident of sexual violence, or when you witness uh, an act or that demeans women or anyone else, you can use nonviolent communication to respond. Uh, for example, if someone were to tell a sexist joke, you could first get the permission to engage. Hey, can I offer you something? Can I tell you something? Uh, and then you would formulate your observations. Uh, I sense that you're trying to gain power by putting other people down, or maybe you're trying to feel better about yourself by putting other people down. And then you can articulate your feelings, needs, and requests. Uh, when I hear a sexist joke that comes uh, that comes at the expense of uh, women and girls, I feel disappointed and confused, and I need to know that women and girls will be respected. So my request to you is simple, stop telling sexist jokes. And this will often provoke reflection, uh, and uh, the person telling the sexist joke might uh, dismiss it in the immediate, but I can guarantee that they will think about that moment some more and when they are alone uh, later uh, at night or during the day. Um, 
Another main focus of our work is bystander intervention. Uh, and in bystander intervention and education, we use all of those skills that we've just uh, mentioned. So the Draw the Line campaign, um, Julie Lalonde will be presenting a bit in more details about the Draw the Line campaign next week. But the Draw the Line campaign is a campaign that focuses on bystander education and focuses on how we can safely intervene uh, and effectively intervene to stop sexual violence and support survivors. The first thing we need to consider when, uh, as a bystander, we witness incidents of sexual violence is um, the, uh, three things. The impact that our intervention or non-intervention would have, the risks and consequences that our involvement could, um, could bring about, and then what we can realistically do. Uh, and we don't, there is no need to be a superhero. Uh, the bystander education campaign focuses on the small, meaningful acts that we can do uh, on a daily basis. Um, and when we consider what we can do in a realistic fashion, we also need to consider factors including our age, our gender, our race, our ability, and um, other factors that are relevant. So our safety should come first. There is no need to put ourselves in arm's way uh, when we're trying to intervene and stop or prevent a sexual violence. So. Um, We've developed a number of realistic scenarios, common scenarios that youth are likely to encounter in uh, their uh, daily lives and ask them uh, discussion-provoking questions. Uh, what would you do if you were in this situation? So that's the front of each of the Draw the Line card, and on the back we offer strategies uh, for intervention. So uh, let's just begin with one of the most popular scenarios here. Um, as a bystander in this situation, you're at a party and your friend says, those girls look really drunk, let's take them upstairs. So do you let it happen? Um, and I would like you to use the poll function to answer that question and really on answer honestly, what would your natural instinct be and not what you think the right answer is? So in that situation, would you do nothing because it's none of your business? Uh, would you put your friends aside and tell them it's not cool? Would you get help uh, and ask others to help you intervene? Or would you warn the girls and ask them if they're fine? All right, this is pretty interesting. Uh, so I, I don't know if you can see, but uh, most of you chose um, pulling your friend aside and telling him it's not cool or getting others to help you intervene. These are both pretty good uh, strategies. Um, these are a little bit problematic, especially since the scenario emphasizes that the girls are, are really drunk. So doing that might not be uh, quite enough in this scenario. They might need a bit more assistance uh, than that. So if we look at the back of the Draw the Line cards, I've uh, broken down their structure for you so you can see how they work. Um, on the top category of sexual violence, uh, and uh, on the left-hand side, there's a short description of why this scenario is problematic. Then we have three different sections. Why bystander intervention matters. When a, bi a situation requires bystander intervention. And the various strategies that bystanders can use to intervene safely and effectively. And that section, um, the section called how to draw the line, so the strategies that bystanders can use to intervene was adapted for a younger public for youth. Uh, so um, you will see that most of the scenarios we've developed uh, have realistic and um, realistic uh, strategies, including reporting it to uh, an adult you trust. Uh, and here the other two options were, uh, that are offered are uh, call in your friend, so pull your friend aside and tell them uh, it's not cool, or alert the others uh, and get help so that uh, other people can help you uh, solve or diffuse uh, that situation. 
Um, on the back of this card, you might notice that uh, the card says, um, consent matters only a sober yes means yes. And this is a statement that provokes a lot of questions amongst youth. Um, youth generally want to know where the legal line is. Uh, they want to know where the law stands. What is uh, sober? What is intoxicated? Where does that line uh, rest? Uh, but that, in our opinion, is not the most productive approach. Uh, scaring people with the law is not always what is most effective. And in fact, there are several other things to consider with this scenario, uh, with a scenario of uh, someone being intoxicated. Um, so I've outlined a couple of these on the left-hand side here. The first is that alcohol does impair our ability uh, to make informed decisions. It impairs our judgment. Uh, so you can make uh, you can compare um, intoxication with other aspects of your life where you wouldn't drive a car under the influence of alcohol. Or in my case, um, I uh, would not go online shopping under the influence of alcohol because I know that uh, my ability to make good and informed decisions has been impaired. Another thing you can emphasize when working with youth uh, with this scenario is that alcohol does impair our ability to communicate clearly with others, not only what we are saying and, uh, verbally or, non or no non-verbally, but also uh, it impairs our ability to fully receive what other people are trying to communicate. Uh, we are not able to pick on every verbal and nonverbal cues that others might be putting out in a situation where alcohol or drugs have been uh, consumed. So because of the consumption of alcohol or um, drugs, you can't be absolutely sure that you get the actual real consent of a person. Another point you can emphasize with this scenario is that you can't possibly accurately determine the level of intoxication of another person. Uh, sometimes it's even hard to determine your own level of intoxication. So thinking that you can know how another person reacts to drugs or alcohol um, and how much is too much for them is not something that you can confidently do. So uh, you shouldn't presume that the other person is sober enough or not intoxicated enough uh, so that their consent is uh, true or real. And the last thing, and this is uh, one thing we put a lot of emphasis in for bystanders, so what would the consequences be if you acted and if you didn't act? So if you didn't act in this scenario, um, you might have to live with the fact that any of the parties involved uh, could regret what uh, would happen next. There could be very bad consequences uh, from this scenario, and as a bystander, as someone who has witnessed it and did nothing, uh, you uh, would probably feel some regret and guilt uh, yourself. On the other hand, if you choose to intervene, you do demonstrate that you care, uh, that you're a stand-up guy or a stand-up person, and that, yes, you will challenge things like the bro code to show that you are a good friend and that you look out, after, uh, look out for those you care about, uh, that you help your friends and the people you care about make good decisions, make choices that they won't regret. So we try to emphasize the positive outcomes of intervention and um, try to use that as a way to motivate youth to intervene and uh, challenge some gender stereotypes, challenge some uh, aspects of, uh, of, their, uh, of the bro code and of youth culture so that uh, they understand that there's um, a loss to be gained uh, from intervening here. Um, 
So as you see, the purpose of the campaign is to start discussions as, about what we can do as active bystanders and allies. Um, it doesn't offer clear cut or simple solutions to all of these questions. Uh, the question of alcohol and consent shows how uh, sometimes it is not as easy as we wish, would wish it to be. But the goal of the campaign is to really have good con conversations about consent, about sexual violence, and about everyone's responsibility when it comes to sexual violence prevention. And um, we emphasize through our work uh, the, the benefits of intervening, of standing up, and uh, the fact that it, you would probably prefer uh, to feel momentarily awkward if you chose to intervene than uh, live with the consequences of uh, doing nothing. Um, all of our work emphasizes consent. Uh, consent is not yes means yes. There are several uh, parts to consent, and we have tremendous work to do when it comes to popular education and what consent means. So uh, you might have seen this before, uh, but there are multiple parts to consent. It is mutual, so both parties have clearly agreed to a given activity. It is enthusiastic. Uh, it is ongoing, so it can be retracted at any time. It, can be, uh, it needs to be asked every step of the way as well. It is specific, and it is, volunteer, it is voluntary, so there is no coercion. It is given freely. It cannot be given by someone else. Um, and it is sober, so uh, people's judgments shouldn't be altered or blurred by drugs or alcohol. Uh, consent is not automatic. Uh, it has to be negotiated each time. Uh, even in the context of a relationship, and that's something that not everybody uh, understands. And consent is not a great area. It has to be clear. Um, and this brings us to where, uh, to the beginning where we started with uh, the, uh, the teammates and coach scenario. So here there can't be uh, any consent because this involves a person in a position of authority with a youth under uh, the age of 18. Uh, so there can't legally be consent in that situation. And it is sexual assault because it involves touching. Uh, harassment is usually uh, verbal. Uh, so sexual assault involves uh, touching. Um, so uh, if, Jen, if you can pull up, uh, I think this is the last poll. If um, you were in a situation where a student reported that they heard from one of their teammates that uh, the coach's actions felt weird, uh, would you believe that student uh, or not, or would you want to ask more questions? So if you can take a moment or two to fill in this poll. I think everyone, uh, all right, everyone participated, so we're split evenly between yes and I would want to ask more questions. So um, wanting to know more is a natural uh, reaction, but that would have to be done with a lot of tact. Uh, so something to consider as an educator uh, in this situation is uh, the quality of your relationship with uh, the victim and your ability to respond effectively to this very difficult situation. Uh, you may conclude that your relationship with the, the victim in this case is good enough and that you do want to support uh, that child. Or you may conclude that it would be best to leave this to mental health professionals or uh, school administrators. Um, there are a few things that shouldn't be done, however. So a few things that 
uh, we shouldn't do. We shouldn't ask questions that would lead the victim to think that we do not believe them. Um, for example, uh, one thing we shouldn't do is ask, are you sure that you remember this correctly? X is a really nice guy. Um, this really shuts down conversations and it shuts down any attempts by that student to reach out and get help because it conveys the idea or the impression that they won't be believed, that they will be doubted. Um, false reports are extremely rare, extremely, extremely, extremely rare, and it is not our role to determine whether the allegations are true or not. We need to leave that to mental health professionals and legal professionals. It is uh, their job to make that determination. Another thing that we do not want to do in this context is ask any questions that would lead the survivor to believe that you are uh, maybe blaming them. Um, for example, you shouldn't ask a question like, why didn't you tell me this earlier? Or why didn't you tell someone earlier? Uh, this could lead uh, the survivor to believe that it was partially their fault, uh, that they are somewhat, somehow to blame uh, for this. Another thing that we shouldn't do is ignore this. Uh, we need to take steps and be good bystanders in this situation and see what we can realistically do and see what we need to leave to uh, professionals. So what this scenario emphasizes is that, and a lot of other scenarios also emphasize that, is that we constantly need to check our own assumptions about uh, the perpetrators and victims of sexual violence. It can be anyone. And in fact, most victims do know their aggressors. Um, we need to remember that disclosing incidents of sexual violence um, is very difficult for victims. And it is particularly difficult when there is a power imbalance, when it involves a person of authority. Uh, and in fact, this relationship of power or this relationship of trust is uh, the main reason why child abuse is very rarely uh, reported. So if we look at what we can do, uh, the back of the card has common sense actions that youth can take uh, in this scenario. These are common sense actions uh, that are small but that do matter on a daily basis uh, for, uh, for the survivors. So the first part uh, for youth is to support and believe the people who are uh, the victim who's reporting the situation. And uh, another suggestion is reporting that incident to an adult uh, you trust, uh, because this is something that youth is not necessarily equipped uh, to deal with, and uh, professionals should probably in, um, handle this situation. As adults working in the education sector, however, we do have obligations. Uh, we do have a legal obligation to report suspected abuse to child protection services. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, you are aware of that. Uh, and there's um, included at the bottom in the links, there's a, a link to the duty to report child and injury protection. So if you need a refresher on that, uh, you can consult that link there. So in some, the campaign highlights that there is no need to be a superhero. Uh, the things you can do uh, can be quite small, but that doesn't mean that they're not meaningful. Uh, so the things you can do are believe. Uh, believe uh, women, believe victims when they tell you that they're uh, experiencing sexual violence. Uh, be a good bystander. Be an active bystander. Don't ignore signs of harassment or assault. Offer support. So you're not an expert oftentimes, uh, and what is best is to offer help and uh, offer any victims uh, help to connect to uh, support services, to professionals. Um, educate yourself and learn more about violence and how to stop it. Uh, lead by example, challenge hurtful language, sexist jokes, and other forms of violence. You can raise awareness. Um, Commemorate important dates, March the 8th is coming up, International Women's Day. Maybe you want to raise awareness to violence against women on that day. Um, ask for help if you yourself are feeling uh, that you need help uh, and could lose control or could use violence or that uh, if you've experienced violence and need help, please reach out for help. And finally, you can be a um, role model. And this is an 
another thing that we uh, work on, we have another program uh, that helps male identified educators and coaches and adults be good role models for uh, boys uh, in their uh, communities. So it's called It Starts With You, It Stays With Them. The link to the campaign website is uh, at the bottom. Uh, again, there's uh, an e-learning module with activities and information about healthy relationships and sexual violence, so you can learn more about this topic, and prov it provides strategies for male-identified um, educators and coaches to be leaders in their community. So the program uh, teaches uh, male-identified youth the language of equality. It teaches them to challenge sexism, homophobia, and degrading language. Uh, it teaches them about consent and boundaries, and it does that uh, by uh, using positive, healthy male role models uh, for them. We have a number of resources for teachers and educators. So there's the It Starts With You uh, campaign that I just mentioned. Um, and uh, we have developed six uh, draw the line scenarios adapted for the um, secondary sector. We have four also for the elementary sector. If you're interested in those for the elementary sector, please uh, contact me. The information, my contact information will be at the end. Um, so we have these six scenarios that discusses and provokes conversation about sexual violence and bystander intervention in schools. And we are currently working on an educator's guide with curriculum connections, very obvious connections with the new health and physical education curriculum, but we are also developing lesson plans um, for uh, subjects outside of uh, health and physical education, including careers, arts, English, civics, social sciences, technology and communications, and uh, family studies. In the next few months, we will also be implementing our Train the Trainer program, offering professional development workshops uh, for uh, teachers and educators and professionals working in the education sector. So this will be available to help bolster your uh, capacity to tackle the, these topics uh, in the classroom. And I think uh, before we move on to uh, the exit uh, cards, I think we have time for uh, some uh, questions. Maybe we can use the chat function, or you can unmute your line if you have a question. Hi, Veronique, it's Jen. Hi, Jen. Hi. So yeah, we definitely have a few minutes for questions, so I'll open up the conference line. The conference is now in talk mode. So feel free to ask your questions over the phone or through the chat box if that's uh, easier for you. And Veronique will do her best to answer your questions. Great. So Joel just asked a question um, about resources for elementary uh, students. Yes, we have resources for elementary students. They are adapted from the six that I've just uh, shown uh, for the secondary sector. They, the scenarios are a little simpler, uh, and so are the strategies. Um, so if you want to see those, they are available on the general Draw the Line website. So draw the line, uh, draw dash the dash line dot ca. The link is also at the bottom. Uh, so all four of them are, are there, or you can contact me directly. Uh, we will also be developing an educator's guide specifically for the elementary sector that will have lesson plans for the primary, junior, and intermediate uh, levels. And uh, we are currently writing those, and we will be piloting those uh, in the next few months and implementing everything in the fall. Um, if you're interested in uh, the piloting phase and want to get involved, I uh, hear there. You have my email. He can contact me, and we would be happy to have you on board. Um, other questions? Um, how would you, this is Maureen, how would you um, suggest trying to implement this um, 
you know, in a curriculum situation across um, all the staff, male mm-hmm. and female. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, the lesson plans are designed to be uh, gender neutral, either in terms of uh, the educator delivering a lesson or uh, the students receiving uh, the lesson. And um, our writers are all experienced educators uh, who are um, making some very clear connections with curriculum expectations that can be checked by having uh, that lesson. And um, all of these will be highly adaptable so you can adapt them to to your community. Um, There will be a promotion campaign to get teachers uh, to raise awareness among teachers, and we will be distributing those very widely in schools in the fall. Uh, But uh, at the end of the day, it will depend on individual teachers' motivation um, to to see if they want to use And I just wonder, like, in the high schools, we still have so many of our classes, you know, are uh, gender segregated, right? At the younger, mm-hmm. especially if one in ten, and so um, you know, it depends on people's obviously. Um, uh, let's see, seriousness related to this issue, um, and 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 because it does tend to be a bit of a gender issue, um, and it yes. does take retraining, obviously, um, both from the student perspective, but also from the staff delivering it. Uh, I see it as an issue of trying to get the uh, both sexes to see it as equal problem that we need to address. Mm-hmm. And I'm not quite sure how to address that. So uh, I, I said gender neutral. There's one, I, I think we're developing a gender specific one for grade nine uh, physical education. Uh, which is, I think, uh, often uh, gender segregated. In terms of um, retraining the teachers, so we're uh, going to be developing that program, uh, the Train the Trainer program, because you are correct. Uh, We need to get teachers to take ownership of this issue, and we need them to feel that it is important and that they need, uh, first, the trainings, and second, uh, the uh, motivation and ability to implement that uh, in their classrooms. Um, so if you, if you have personal experiences or suggestions of how uh, we can maximize our reach with teachers who might be less open to these questions, I would be very, very interested in hearing, uh, hearing those suggestions. Um, we do have um, a promotion campaign planned, so hopefully that will draw up attention and interest. Uh, but yeah, we, we can't. Uh, coerce anyone into uh, applying no. in their class. No. <laughs> right. Okay. So when will, sorry, it'll be the cur- new curriculum and you said there will be some gender kind of neutral or or um, stuff that's specific to female classes that might be different to male classes is going to be available in the fall? Yes, that will be available uh, in the fall. We are drafting uh, the lesson plans and uh, the guides framework as we speak. Excellent. That's great. Any other questions? We do have some time. Uh, well, maybe we can uh, consider then, uh, that would be very interesting for me uh, to hear from you. So if you can take a moment to type and think upon, uh, reflect upon one thing you learned today and one thing you would like to do uh, in your school or community, uh, if you can only think of, of an idea for one of those two, that's fine as well. But it's always good to hear from you. Um, and we also have, uh, I think Jen will mention it, but there's a link in my presentation and also at the bottom, uh, evaluate this webinar. Uh, we do welcome your feedback uh, and it is very important for us to uh, evaluate this webinar. Uh, we do welcome your feedback uh, and it is very important for us to hear uh, from you and um, what works, what uh could be improved and uh, what areas you would like to learn uh, more um, about. That's always uh, valuable. 
valuable and valued feedback. We do have a male facilitator, Kevin, who works uh, with young boys uh, and um, usually has very productive discussions uh, in, in this context. I, I have to say that half of my colleagues here are, are male identified uh, and uh, that um, our choice of facilitator is often deliberate. Um, and we do work with ETFO if you're affiliated with ETFO and have uh, workshops and conferences for specifically for boys. And so Maureen wrote that uh, the role of interveners is much clearer. Uh, yes, and this is what uh, the campaign aims to do, is to move focus away from perpetrators and victims or survivors and instead really take collective ownership of this issue. Uh, this is an issue that affects everyone in our society. It is not just a problem for uh, the perpetrators or for the survivors, uh, and we all have a role to play. And that role can be uh, pretty small in terms of just supporting the survivors we know, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that it is not meaningful and that it won't make a difference when we interrupt uh, and prevent acts of sexual uh, violence. I'll put my contact information up again. Please uh, get in touch. Uh, we are funded through the Ministry of Education and therefore are often able to offer uh, these resources uh, for free. If you're interested in the drawline scenarios and would like copies to bring in your school, we have posters and postcards and are able to send those uh, to you as well so that you can uh, use them. Um, uh, the Educator's Guide will also be uh, distributed in schools next fall. That's great. Thank you so much, Veronique, and thanks everyone for your questions. Those are great questions. Um, that was a great discussion. We hope that you all learned as much as we did about how Ontario schools can become safer, more inclusive spaces. If you have more follow-up questions, feel free to contact or for, to connect with OPIA, and we can facilitate connecting you to the experts or to the experts. Sorry, uh, Veronique has kindly put her contact information there, so she can also answer your questions. Um, before you go, please take a couple of minutes to complete the evaluation to the webinar. Just select white ribbon under the event sponsor for this second uh, webinar. And don't forget to register your school for campaign messengers taking a stand if you're interested in being part of this initiative and in taking these really important messages back to your school. As a participating school, you will receive support from OFIA in designing and implementing an action plan to lead at least one activity in your school. Uh, you'll also be invited to participate in an in-person peer sharing event on uh, June 6th and 7th at uh, the YMCA Cedar Glen. And travel and accommodation, as well as supply costs, are gladly paid by OFIA, so definitely check that out. And um, go get involved and keep these conversations happening. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll stick around for a couple of minutes, just in case anyone else has any last things to say. But other than that, um, have a great evening. Thank you, everyone, for listening and participating. Uh, it's always great to work with educators and uh, people involved in the education sector, they're very, they're very inspiring. Yeah, thank you so much, Vilina. I think you've definitely helped to uh, clarify a lot of things for educators and students, so that's great. So if anyone has any last comments, feel free to put them in the, contact, or the chat box, and um, I will close the phone line if everyone is done. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.